Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove, and today we'll be looking at plant evolution and diversity. Now, all of the energy in the food that we eat uh, originates from the sun, and it's stored in the food through the process of photosynthesis. It is the responsibility of the producers, the autotrophs of the world, for doing photosynthesis, for taking the solar energy and storing it in the bonds of food. On land, plants are the main terrestrial producers. Now, the ancestor of the modern green plant is most likely um, single-celled algae. Uh, in particular, a group of algae that probably has very close ties to modern plants is a group called uh, the carophytes. Now, the reason that scientists believe this is that there's distinct evidence. Uh, for example, um, when we compare the cell walls of these single-celled algae to modern-day plants, they're very, very similar. In addition to that, um, the DNA of the, the charophytes and plants are very, very similar, indicating that they do have a close relationship. Now, plants, algae, uh, they began their life in the water. Um, but uh, in order for their history to end up where it is today, they had to move on to land. Now that movement onto land came with a lot of potential risks. For example, water has a high heat capacity. It doesn't change temperature very much throughout the day. Whereas land, from morning till noon to night, the air temperature fluctuates greatly. There's a greater chance for drying out. If you're living in water, if you're a water plant, you don't have to worry about drying out. But on land, you do. Additionally, water affords a protective layer that diffuses the harmful ultraviolet light that can mutate DNA. So movement on the land definitely has some certain risks, but the rewards uh, are also great. There's plenty of carbon dioxide to be able to perform photosynthesis. The sunlight uh, is not diffused by water. It's, you know, direct access to the sun. Uh, if you're first on land, then there's little uh, to no herbivores. Uh, so if you're already living in the water, there's a lot of fish that eat uh, plants. Um, but if you're the first plant on land, you don't have to worry about somebody eating you. So it's uh, important that plants did make their way onto land because it paved the way for other organisms. Uh, they would be the food for herbivores, and they helped build up um, the soil. So to survive on land, a plant must have evolved, must have obtained certain adaptations to allow for its survival. So in order to avoid drying out, plants end up having a waterproof covering. A lot of plants, especially on their leaves, have a waxy cuticle layer that prevents them from drying out. In water, there's a certain amount of buoyancy. You don't need a lot of additional support. But if you're going to move on to land, you have to stand up against gravity because air is not very buoyant. So um, you have to have strong cell walls if you're going to be a plant on land. If you're going to move on to land, you have to be able to access nutrients and water. If you're in water, you're surrounded by it, and so you can allow for diffusion and osmosis to provide for your nutrients and the like. But if you're on land, you're going to need specialized tissues, roots, uh, stems, and leaves to be able to obtain and transport uh, that essential nutrients. And then you have to have a way to be able to reproduce outside of the water. If you're living in water uh, you're, and you're reproducing sexually, your sperm can easily find its way to an egg. But if you're on land, you have to have uh, a way to reproduce um, without the uh, extra assistance of water. So when um, the ancestors of modern plants made it onto land um, about 475 million years ago, there was a lot of opportunities, and they were able to diversify rapidly and led to the formation of all of our modern lines of plants. Without any kind of predators um, and plenty of resources, the plants were able to really master land. Now, the first land plants were probably much like our mosses today in that they're non-vascular. The early plants um, didn't have 
roots and stems with specialized tubes to be able to transport water great distances. So without these roots and stems, they had to remain close to the water's edge. Without the vascular tissue, without the veins, which allows for stems and roots, it really limited the size of these early land plants, requiring them to be small and to live in very moist environments. To be able to really move inland, um, you really have to have a way to get water that's deeper into the earth, not just necessarily on the surface. And so those plants that were able to develop roots and shoots um, to move water and other essential nutrients up and around the plant were going to be able to uh, begin that march inland. The first vascular plants were probably ferns or fern-like organisms and other seedless plants. Now these ferns and other seedless plants really began to dominate the land. In fact, some ferns actually grew as big as trees. But these early vascular plants still had their limitations. Ferns don't produce seeds, they reproduce with spores. And these spores are very fragile and so they don't last a really long time. Another problem is ferns, they utilize free swimming sperm. Uh, and so in order to have successful fertilization, um, mosses and ferns need to have water in the form of rainfall um, to be able to allow for um, fertilization and reproduction. So this limits where these early vascular plants could have been found. So pollen and seeds uh, really allowed for land plants to flourish. First of all, pollen is going to contain our male gametes, the sperm, and the ability for the pollen to move around is not limited by rainfall. In fact, pollen finds it very easy to move around um, even when it's dry. Seeds, unlike our uh, spores, they actually have a protective layer that's going to be able to protect our little embryo. Um, the seeds themselves are adapted with many different ways for dispersal. For example, uh, this little guy here, called the helicopter or whirly gig, um, is able to be dispersed by air. Um, other seeds are enclosed in fruit, which will, you know, entice animals to come along and um, take them from place to place. And then finally, unlike spores, um, seeds, they're very durable. Um, they can lie dormant for a really long time, protecting the embryo, waiting for the con right conditions to be able to um, sprout. Um, for example, seeds have actually been taken from the Great Pyramids and have successfully germinated, indicating that these seeds are very durable. Now, the first seeded plant um, were probably like our modern-day gymnosperms. Most gymnosperms are cone-bearing plants, or conifers. Notice the first part of this word, cone, means they have cones. Now, the reason why they're called gymnosperms is because the seeds are produced without any kind of covering. They're not completely enclosed. Um, they're held up inside of our you know, cone as they develop. And as soon as they're ripe, then the cone is gonna open up and then be able to drop the seeds. Um, and since they're not completely covered, they're called naked or uh, Greek gymnos. Um, and then sperm is for seed, gymnosperm. They're naked seeds. They're not covered by any covering except for the plates of the pine cones. Now, conifers, um, they are going to have needle-like leaves, which allow them to be adapted to colder or drier weather. So where we find them a lot in kind of the northern temperature regions. Here's some other gymnosperms. Uh, ginkgo is a gymnosperm and the cycads. Now, the most successful uh, plant is probably the angiosperms or the flowering plants. Um, there are about 235,000 species in comparison to just over 700 gymnosperms. And part of that success is due to the flower. 
The flower not only is a great reproductive structure, um, it allows for um, attraction of various pollinators so that you can reproduce over long distances. Um, additionally, um, once a seed is produced, um, a lot of times a flower will develop into a fruit. And when animals uh, devour that fruit, they take those seeds into their bodies. And when they move, eventually uh, that those seeds will pass through them and uh, end up in their feces and will have survived the digestive process. And so they'll be in a moist environment surrounded by nutrients and they'll be able to germinate far away from their parent plant. And so uh, the development of flowers really, really led to the diversification of plants. Now, our flowering plants can be further classified based upon additional characteristics as either being monocots or dicots. Dicots have two seed leaves. So when they open up, um, they're going to open up kind of like a book. And so they'll have two seed leaves. Um, when we look at their leaves, their leaves are going to form a network of veins. So like most of your trees, you know, they have that network of veins. Typically, some good examples of the dicots are trees, shrubs, and beans. The monocots only have one seed coat. So when we look at them, they don't open up like a book. They're just going to have their embryo in a single seed coat. The leaves of monocots, they have parallel veins, um, like our grasses or lilies. Monocots and dicots, you know, they all are angiosperms. They all are flowering plants. And even though the flowers are going to vary widely in appearance, they're going to have certain structures in common. For example, uh, they're going to have male parts, which are called the stamen, and female parts, which are called the pistil. The male part, or stamen, consists of a long filament, which on the top, it has an anther in which the pollen uh, grains are developed. On our female plant, uh, it contains three parts of the pistil. The top part is called the stigma, and usually the stigma is sticky, which facilitates pollen to stick to it. Um, the stigma is then separated from the ovaries, uh, the seeds, that are going to be fertilized uh, by the, the sperm that's come with the pollen by the style. So really, as I said, the key to the success of angiosperms is that flower and fruit. The fruit protects the seeds and helps with their dispersal. The fruit can act as a bribe so that animals can eat the fruit and spread the seeds like this orangutan here. And then bat bees and bats and birds can help with that pollina pollination um, across great distances. They're attracted to the flowers by nectar, and then when they visit, um, they're able to transfer pollen from one flower to the next. So flower er, so plants have met with great success over the years. As a result of uh, evolution by natural selection, uh, we have a great diversity of plants that exist today. And without those plants uh, providing us with photosynthesis, we would not have the food and oxygen that allow us to survive.